Well, let me, hi, Tammy. I was going to briefly tell people how we started, how this whole thing sort of started real quick while waiting for questions. And that is a number of years ago. Tammy and I have known each other for maybe 15 years, something like yeah. that. And we worked for different organizations and I've been wanting to work together for a long time. And we had an opportunity to develop a treatment program and online stuff online was exploding. And we were looking for ways to reach out to people, not just to support our business, but because we wanted to do some service and help folks who might not make the therapy or might not make it to 12 step meetings. And this grew into a website full of volunteers and, and free groups. And uh, it's just sort of, it's been exactly what I had hoped, which is a community where we can come together and get support without having to worry about money or time or anything. So Tammy, any thoughts about that? Because look what I we do. did, look what like, you did. Like I was emailing the people who volunteered just for the drop-in groups. There are 19 people that volunteer oh for the drop-in groups. So so I'm, and I um, am in discussion with somebody else who's like, oh, I'm, I'd be happy to do it. And I've got some other, and I was like, great. Yeah, I mean, we will always take more opportunities for people. That does not include the people that are there for, for the various webinars. So it, that was just drop in, in group participants. So I'm incredibly grateful. You can find the entire list of all of our webinars and drop-in groups. Some people are watching this on YouTube, great. But on sexandrelationshiphealing.com, you can find the entire list of, of all the different drop-in groups, they're actually labeled, um, you know, like who should attend, a partner, an addict, the couple. Um, the, the, so webinars and drop-in groups are all listed there. The podcast, Dr. Rob's Sex, Love, and Addiction. I really do have to look um, into that because I bet that's got to be close to a million. It was, it was under a million. It was 900 and some thousand uh, downloads, but I bet it's pushing a million if it isn't already hit that. So I will look, but I don't have the update on that. Not right now. Don't no. leave me. And, well, and so, and I put in the chat, so the, so the, all the free resources are in sex and relationship healing.com, but we have a work group, including the out of the doghouse for men who have been caught cheating starting tomorrow night. Those are six week courses, 90 minutes per night or day, whatever per, per week, uh, live facilitated. This is not just watching videos. I know that can be a thing, but that's not what this is. It is uh, interactive and facilitated. And we have four betrayed partners, sex addiction 101, porn addiction 101, out of the doghouse, attachment wounds, inner child, and we've got more coming. So betrayed so partners keep group those is coming. Yeah. Well, it's already, ro already, it's going already on, rolling. Right? Yeah. So the next I'm still offering manual, is June so. 8th. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's, it's all good. So, but we do have questions now, so we're going to get started with those. Oh, good. But you know what, Tammy, it's better. They mm -hmm. ask us questions than we sit here and talk. Um, yes. I appreciate that. Let's go. Um, so, so if you put your questions in the Q and a, they'll get answered. If they, if things go in the chat, not so much. So, okay. The first question is how does a CSAT, so certified sex addiction therapist determine healthy masturbation habits with an addict? Well, Tammy, you worked with that organization for a long time, and I bet you heard a lot of different presenters talk about this issue. So rather than me diving in, would you start? Yeah, no, I actually, like, regardless of a, see somebody who's qualified, and sometimes it's your sponsor is working, you know, with you on that. So, so you know, I, I, so let me, I'll back up and answer the, a CSAT is a certified sex addiction therapist. They are trained specifically to work within this population. You know, I, I talk often to people who are, you know, well, I've got a therapist, but they're a general therapist. And I, I use the analogy of, I love my GP. He, you know, he's, he's really good. And for no, normal things, he's great. But when I have, you know, a certain situation, like if I have cancer, I'm going to the cancer specialist. You know, when I had sinus surgery, I went to the sinus surgery first. I go to the specialist who was trained to do this work. So, so getting the right help makes a world of difference. And so, so that's kind of the premise of, you know, here's what a CSAT does, but. Well, and, and oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tammy. No, no, no I was I'm say, sorry. But, but not all of the CSATs use the tools that they've been trained with. So it's also discerning who is actually doing a really good job within the training. So I'll set it up like that. And then can you talk about how do you decide, you know, what would be healthy masturbation, if anything, you know, for someone? Well, I wanted to reinforce one thing you said is that, you know, um, with treatment centers, for example, people will say, oh, this place is amazing or that place is amazing. And, and a treatment center is only as amazing as the staff who work there. 
So I worked in, God, a bunch of them before I'd starting them. And there would be situations where you'd have an intern who was under supervision with me. They would hire someone who'd been, who was a recovering addict, but didn't have a license. It's just, um, it, it's not about the name. It's about who's doing the work. Um, and it always comes down to that because it's who we hire and who we oversee and how we train. And, you know, and I always believe just to say this, that your employees are your most important asset. But uh, back to masturbation, but back to masturbation. <laughs> uh, sorry, how could I forget? Um, you know, I agree with Tammy that I think it takes someone who is involved in your life, who knows your program and your recovery, and someone who is willing to tell you things that you don't want to hear. Because I can go to a trust at meeting and I can have everyone in the world say, oh, you, everyone could do this. No one has to do disclosure with their spouse. Of course, those are the ones who or the people they're talking to are the people who don't want to disclose to their spouses. So I can always find somebody to tell me whatever it is I want to hear. Um, if you have someone you trust, like a sponsor, like a therapist, someone who's able and willing to say, look, you're full of, you know, whatever, that's the best route because they know your history. In other words, I don't make decisions like this for myself, or I wouldn't even look through a book and say, well, that's the right answer. I turn to the people who know me and know me well in recovery. And this is why we encourage 12-step groups or other support groups like the ones we have is you need other people as guides, you know. Uh, I can tell you how to buy an old car. I can. I'm pretty good at it, but I cannot tell you if I don't know how to do this, how to do this. Most therapists don't know how to say the word masturbation. I'm so sorry to say that. But anyway, I'll tell you a couple of things. I'll tell you what Dr. Patrick Harms told me in the beginning. Years and years ago, someone asked, long before the internet and porn, someone asked, what is healthy masturbation? I'll never forget this. And he said, he said, you know, well, if you were to take someone out on a date, you know, you probably wouldn't invite them. And I mean, someone you wanted to get to know and spend time with and were interested. You probably wouldn't invite them into your house, have sex with them and have them leave. I mean, maybe you do that for, you know, another reason. But if you wanted to get to know someone, you take them to dinner, you'd have a bite to eat, you spend time together. Then you might come back for some smooching, but you would have some kind of connection. And he said, masturbation is kind of like the same thing. You need to go out and have a bite to eat. You need to go to a movie. You need to take yourself for a walk, read a book, come home, light some candles, you know, make it something that's related to yourself rather than three minutes in the back room with some pork, you know? And so as a long time recovering person, that would be the answer that I would give you. It's not the answer I would give someone in early recovery. In early recovery, I would say, look at your history. If masturbation has been part of your, part of your porn problem, then take a couple of months and do neither one. And then say, I'd like to try masturbation if it's okay with my sponsor, my therapist. And then I get to masturbate without the porn a couple of times and then go back and report in. This is why you need those people. You know, after I masturbated once or twice, all I wanted to do was look at porn. Okay, then masturbation is not a good idea for you. You know, I masturbated once or twice and I was back out there with my affair partner, probably not fit for you. But if it's something that you find, you know, like alcohol, if you can do it occasionally and put it down, it's not a problem. It isn't for me to determine and there is no rule. You know, Tammy, I think a lot of times people want the rule. In 90 days, is it going to be this? And in six months, and of course, I understand that. But that's like taking the checklist in vogue, you know, or cosmopolitan. Like, that's not real life. Everyone is different. Everyone responds differently. Spouses want to hear. I want to know that he or she's never going to do that again. I, I, I doubt that. What I think is possible is that they can be completely honest. They can be completely forthcoming. They can be uh, involve you in their recovery and their struggle. Um, by the way, I'm going off in tangents, Tammy, but a little piece of this. For you spouses who say the following, if you do this again, I'm going to leave. Two things. Number one, be sure and prepared to leave if this person does that again, because once an addict knows that your word doesn't mean anything. But the other thing is that, um, that it doesn't, why would I want to tell you anything about what I was struggling with if, I t if you told me that if I tell you this, uh, you're going to leave me? So it's a disincentive for me to be honest with you if you say I'm leaving, if this happens again, unless you really are going to leave. What you really want is for me to come to you and say, God, I really struggled last night. Such and such happened. I talked to my sponsor. I talked to my program. I'm letting you know this is what I'm doing about it. Um, and then it's not going to be good at home for a, a while. But most of you spouses will come to realize, I think, oh, let me see what's different here. All right. I'm getting the truth. And 99.9% .9 of what you guys want, you spouses, you just want to know the truth. There, that's my rant for the night, Tammy. I have I dropped something during that rant. Well, that's right okay. The, the, that was all really helpful. The only caveat I'm going to add to that is if you hear your, if you're the betrayed partner and your 
your spouse goes to his and I'm using his and her, but it's just, you know, for convenience. Um, if he goes to his therapist and he says, my therapist said, and you have no validation other than what he says his therapist said, you know, that would be, that would be concerning to me. I would, I would want to hear what the, your therapist actually said. Um, unfortunately, because we love addicts. Well, yeah, I was going to say, just kind of like what Dr. Rob was saying is like, I can go to somebody and, you know, oh, it's got no, you know, it's got no meaning to me. And like, no, I didn't go off into fantasy and no, I did you know, so um, it, that would be the other piece of that. Now we've got lots of questions. So my essay had a number of physical, emotional affairs, porn, cyber sex, et cetera. He was abusive, gaslighting, et cetera, over many years. He also perpetrated a betrayal that was an addiction. It was a training type of activity, which he kept secret and spent hundreds of dollars, hours and thousands of dollars. This included in his uh, formal therapeutic disclosure as he recognized it was a huge betrayal and the same selfish behavior. He recently talked about that activity with someone who doesn't know about his essay and doesn't know the secret. Mm, I don't know what the question is. Um, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, will I, say I guess this, I don't know. Can, yeah. uh, is that co-occurring issues do happen. And if oh, we are intensity seekers. On, on, oh, continued the secret nature and betrayal aspect. He was asked if it was worth it. And my husband said, yes, exclamation point. I now wonder what other betrayal activities were worth it to him, like his physical and emotional affairs. Can he really be making amends if he still thinks those activities were worth it? Mm. Okay, I lost, uh, I'm trying to find that, that one was down there. Two. It says continued at 506. It says anonymous attendee and continued oh, okay, at 506. Yes. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's why I didn't think it was. So, okay. You find it? Oh, there's a, yeah. Yeah. Keep them short, people. It helps because, like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm having a, little trouble with this what i'm hearing is there was another compulsive behavior that's and it, it was a betrayal because lots of money was spent on the spouse didn't know and so now what i think happened is he or she went to talk to someone else about their problem with the compulsive behavior that cost a lot of money but they didn't say anything about the sex part and that's well, a betrayal to the spouse is i'm not getting well that? you're really close so you're you're right there <laughs> and then and then he he was like, be, because it's taken out of context and it's just talking about this behavior, the other person not knowing about how problematic it is, was said, it was it worth it? And he oh. goes, yes. And now the betrayed partner is going, does he feel like that about oh. everything? That was a bad move. Um, well, I, 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 here's what I would suggest is you go back to him and say, let, so let me say this, um, addicts, have some narcissistic traits and uh, they show up in all kinds of ways. Well, we don't want to look bad. And if someone, if we're bragging to say, oh, I did this and that, you know, and then do you, was it worth it? Of course it was worth it. In other words, I don't want to look bad. I'm not even thinking about how it might affect you, what I'm saying. I just want to say to this other person, I'm so cool. And so oftentimes we don't see the things that might hurt you. And I think you have to go, even though you think we would, I think you have to go back and say, I'm really wondering, since this was a betrayal to me, does, because what it makes me feel like is it was all fine because that wasn't fine and you did hurt me and you told me it was a betrayal and now you're going back on that. So it leaves me less trusting and angry. I think you have to, you know, I'm, this is a therapist talking, we're always sound better than it really comes out in real life. But nonetheless, I think it has, your discomfort needs to be shared with him exactly what happened and see what he says. You know, I would tell him, I don't trust, I trust you less now, you know, nothing wrong with saying that. Um, and I don't see, and we haven't heard Tam, I'm going to back up to the beginning. I didn't hear anything about therapists, full disclosure. Well, they had a formal a disclosure. disclosure. So I'm, I'm yeah. assuming that there's qualified therapists in the mix of that, but, and, okay. and hopefully you're getting support as a betrayed partner, you know, to talk about, but, but yes, I mean, what I, Right initially was the physical, emotional affairs, cyber, cyber abusive gaslighting, like so yeah, lots of problematic behaviors. So to me, it is a really unwell thought out move to go. Yeah, that was great, you know, and uh, you, you're not. So I'm also assuming, unfortunately, this is probably 
fairly early in the recovery, you know, you've had formal therapeutic disclosure. That wasn't five years ago, I bet. So I'm thinking it's fairly early. So I love what Dr. Rob said, you know, be honest and say that, you know, that was so hurtful when I hear this and it, it makes me, it erodes any trust that we were working on building. So now we got to start over. So you, I mentioned the out of the doghouse uh, work group that starts tomorrow. That's about rebuilding trust. That might be a really good fit for him to kind of learn how to be empathetic and, and have a little more clue instead of clueless. So, okay. Um, the next question is, what is the best way to help my wife deal with triggers that she has regarding my infidelity? Uh, well, I don't really have, we don't have quite enough information. We can give some general clues. What, what do you think? It I'm thinking you do your work. You, you work on being a man of integrity. You work on not be doing the things that are triggering. You having the capacity, Dr. Eddie Capucci does a great job with his webinars on talking about, you know, uh, holding the emotional space, being in the emotional discomfort. There, I mean, he lays out a plan for some of that stuff, but, but what, you know, what support does your wife have? You know, we've got all these betrayed partner groups. We've got a betrayed partner work group starting, you know, on June 8th. So if she's getting support and you're doing your work, you know, that, that helps, you know, now there's some specific things, you know, sometimes just for the triggers, if they're really highly activating, then, you know, doing a little trauma work um, like EMDR on those specific things. Um, but, but here's my caveat with this, because I hear often, it's like, I want to focus on helping my wife and it just shifts the focus. And I'm not saying you're doing this. I'm just, it's a, it's a warning. Um, if, you know, if you're going, oh, I'm going to help her and you're not, you know, it takes the focus off you doing the harder work for you. Um, that, that can be counterproductive to like, you know, you're, you're not showing up differently. You're just, you know, shifting the focus. So that's my thought. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to try to say this as briefly as I can. Now the questions are piling in fast and heavy. Yeah. So number Let's one, keep I them in the Q and A, please. And we, yeah, and we, you, you can lower your hands because we don't take any live um, questions on this. So if you're new, great. We love having you here. Keep them in the Q and A. We're going to do our best to to roll through them. Uh, short is good. So, uh, but we'll we're going to do our best. So I wanted to answer the question from Jay about dealing with triggers. I completely agree, Tammy. That. In fact, you know, we we run a treatment center called Seeking Integrity, and I always have guys there who are so focused on, they keep saying they're focused on themselves, but really they, but, but what, what happens when I go home? What is my wife going to say? And, what, and you know what these spouses hate is you're focusing on them. I can tell you the three things not to do. Don't tell your wife you're sorry. Don't tell her you apologize. Don't tell her oh, gee, I'm a sex addict and I didn't know it. And had I known it, I wouldn't have done these things to you. Just, just let her be and own your stuff. And th the reason that Tammy keeps talking about Out of the Doghouse is a book I wrote for men who've cheated because I know that after 20 years of work, 25 men don't know how to make up. Even non-addicts do not know how, do not understand the depth of pain that cheating has cost a, caused a woman, nor do they understand how to make it better. So I basically wrote this book, said, hey, if you want to heal the harm you've caused through betrayal, you need to read this. And then they hate that book because it really does tell them what to do. And we, and I guess we're teaching a course in it. So anyway, um, the best way you can deal with it is stay out of the way. Uh, oh, by the way, there is one more thing. Do your work. Like in, in the, what Tammy did, put something on the fridge and say, this is what I'm doing Monday. This is what I'm doing Tuesday at, you know, meetings, therapy. So your spouse can see that you have a plan. What, last thing I'll say, None of your words matter. Nothing you say matters. What matters is what are you doing to reassure your spouse by your behavior that you have made a commitment to change. And that also includes that they're not saying to you, well, why haven't you gone there? Or what are you doing today? Or because they constantly see you coming up with honesty and honest behavior. Um, you earn your way back uh, out of those triggers. It's nothing you say and it's nothing you can do with your spouse. You have to do your own work. There, I just repeat everything you said, Tammy. There you go. <laughs> Let's see. So the next one, I think this person has asked this question before, so I'm going to read it, but we'll, we've got lots of them. So um, been sober since December of 2020, 
trickle disclosures, has the CSAT attending, my acting out behaviors are pornography and image addiction, no sex or anything like that outside of my marriage. And all the lies and deceits have come with that. I have read the books out of the doghouse and help her heal. And then my wife and I went through the divorce process and she had the courage. Yeah, I know this. I've seen this before. And she had the courage to step back into the relationship with me in October of last year during our lived away time, during most of that time, coming back together in and out of the house. Okay. This thing about a short yeah. question. This I know. Like, yeah, across. I know. That's And, and this is, I know. I, this is but it doesn't matter because so. let's get outside. So you right now work. she is back in trauma and angry, which I have acknowledged in her anger. She says certain things. So basically his question is, do I have the right to set a boundary? Right. on things she can and cannot right. say to me when she is angry and may i make a suggestion tammy going forward yeah. i i just uh, a little bit about sort of therapy thinking i know the last three sentences are all we needed to know the rest of it right. is just this person needing to say what's going on with them but yes. the real question is simply uh sorry i have to go down five times to yeah so uh, it's the 505 uh-huh thank you the real question is um if my spouse gets angry and says things that feel abusive to me, and by the way, someone saying I'm angry might feel abusive to you, but I'm talking about things that are really hurtful or, or very direct and you know, I, it, it, loud. Um, there is nothing wrong with setting a boundary. You know, um, we have all kinds of ways of doing that. Gesundheit. You could um, make an agreement when things are going well about what you're gonna do when things are going badly. Uh, I've said to my spouse, who can be uh, not always polite, that, you know, you can tell me I did something this happened the other day. Um, he came home, he's in a bad mood, and he said, I can't believe you. Oh, I opened one of his FedEx packages. And he said, you know, those are private. They're important to me. It was nothing, but nonetheless. And I said, yeah, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have opened that. And then he said something like, you know, people really don't like it when you open their stuff. And I was like, yep. And by, then there was a third one. And I said, you know, I'm sorry, and I did the wrong thing, but you don't have, need to come after me three times. You know, I'm willing to hear it. I'm willing to own my stuff. Uh, it, no one gets to call me names. No one gets to tell me I don't deserve to live. Nobody tells me I haven't loved my children. You know, things that are cruel. And I am certainly willing and open to say, you know what? I don't think I can hear that right now. I'm going to take a break. And we have all this stuff in the courses that talks about timeouts and how to escape difficult circumstances and how to. Um, come back and make sure the person doesn't think you've abandoned them. And there are all kinds of methods for doing this, but absolutely everyone gets the right to have a boundary. And I have heard sex addicts say, it's okay if he or she hits me because I deserve it. No, that's not true. You may feel like you deserve it, but it's not okay for anybody to hit you or question you're deserving to live. Um, Tammy, do you have some stuff? Well, I, 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 yeah, and we've talked about it in bunches of webinars too, the timeouts or, and not talking about it when you're all revved up, you know, when you're in, in anger is the wrong time to have a plan, have a plan so that the next time, you know, things get heated, here's what we're going to do. So it's not, you know, abandoning or anything else. It's just, I'm going to step away. I'm going to go call my sponsor, you know, whatever it is, you know, we'll, I'll check back in in 20 minutes. Okay. It's, st it's still not ready. Okay. Well, you know, come back to it. But, um, but it, 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 I often hear too, the, you know, I deserve it and, and we don't. And so I put in the, ch in the chat, uh, Gavin Sharp did a really good webinar um, on December 1st of last year on attic boundaries. And he said, we all need healthy boundaries. And I was like, that is so true. And so I would invite you both to watch that and have a discussion about it. But, but you know, uh, her, her anger, I mean, that, that's, that can be the rage and anger are a powerful tool unto themselves. So what, what is she doing to work on her anger, you know, would be, um, you know, I, you said you have kids like that's, you know, what is she doing so that she isn't mirroring that for the family too? And um, okay. by the way, I know that some people feel and I understand this, you've ruined my life, you, you've wrecked everything that was important to me, but there isn't another side of that. And so I'm now a title entitled to hurt you. Um, if you want to hurt somebody, then you're hurting. Well, of course, you're hurting yourself and you don't want to commit the same pain to someone else that they have caused you. And I'm not saying to, you know, turn the other cheek. There's a lot of work to do and a lot of feelings that you have, but to, to attack, um, not helpful for anybody. By the way, Tammy, I have to admit that my dog decided to sit at the bottom of the desk and now the dog is licking my ankle. And so I don't know why, but 
he's like, so if I look like I'm grinning for some silly reason, it's because my dog because you're getting tickled. To, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, and this is for a sex addict. This is really quite, you know, innocent in a way. So, anyway, go ahead. So next I question. Smile. Betrayed partner. My essay husband has a problem admitting fault. Um, that is so true. So um, he chooses to avoid, ignore, and not just not talk at all cost when angry. I got angry, expected him to accept my frustration, anger, and rectify the situation. Instead, he chose to give me the silent treatment. When um, promoted with a, or when prompted with a question to speak, he would not. He went by without a word. Eight hours later, went home, went home, wanted to apologize. The what for, although important, not needed for my question. Is it okay for me to, accept, oh, I think this, to, oh yeah, it's continued to apologize for giving me the silent treatment. I find it abusive, punishing, gas lighting in a way. What do you think? Okay. Is the silent treatment okay? So, um, if I've hurt you, it's my responsibility to try to make it good. And so part of, and, uh, being in the doghouse means I'm not in the house with you. I'm out back. And if I want to be out back, cause I've hurt you or my family, I have to earn my way back. And if earning my way back means doing a disclosure, why would I not want to do that? Because my goal is to make you feel better and to be back as a part of our family. So what this person is arguing Wait, against, you're, 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 you're on my the essay husband the doesn't one. want to provide disclosure. No, and the we're on isn't. the betrayed partner. My essay oh. husband has a problem admitting fault and the, oh, and then that the one. silent Sorry. treatment. And then it's my continued. Bad. Yeah, no, it's okay. No, it's the continuous part. So I know it's that. challenging. So, um, so, um, but we'll get to the disclosure. Yeah, right it's now. really, so, uh, well, it's the same question, you know, um, it really is the same question, which is, um, if he wants to ignore and not talk and, you know, not want to deal with your anger, then he's pushing you away. I mean, it's really the same to me. Sorry, I don't mean to be right here, but the issue of if his, if his goal is to work things out with you and make you feel better and make this family or relationship whole, um, then to, say to you, well, I don't want to hear about that. And I don't want to talk about that. And I don't want to, I mean, what, excuse my language, how has he or she earned the right to say to you, um, I don't want to hear about that, you know, or I don't want to talk about that. It, 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 it doesn't make sense if their goal is to get closer to you and work things out. So um, now if he's got emotional issues that mean when he's directly confronted, he shuts down and runs away, which I see here, that's a great thing to talk about in therapy provided when he's in a better place, like with the apology, he, you can say, you know, I think this is something that you need to work on or we need to work on in therapy um, because I don't know why he did it, but why he did it and what it was for him has nothing to do with the fact that you have every right to be respected. And what we talk about in some of the coursework is um, this whole timeout issue. Again, we're there, which is I can leave for a few minutes and say, I, I, I'm too hot. I can't deal with this, but I will come back within a certain amount of time ready to talk about it. And it's more like 45 minutes. So, you know, those are lessons that couples can learn in therapy, but this is not acceptable to answer the question. Well, yeah. And, and I'm thinking that this is a pattern because like, you're really angry. This is not the first time he's done this. So, so can the two of you, when you're not in a heated moment, talk about what is the goal? You know, like if we're looking to have a better relationship, if we're looking to be connected in a real and meaningful way, then these patterns are not working for or us. So, so if, you know, if, if he really is, um, if he's in recovery, like, he, you know, he's not just abstinent five minutes, then, you know, then it's time to start working with you know, a couple's therapist that can help you navigate this. And, and, um, but again, lots of free resources on our site. I can, you know, I can point you towards um, specific webinars that are helpful that, you know, give you parameters, do these four things, you know, that can, can help you. The other thing is an apology. If it's just lip service from a, um, an addict who doesn't really get it is going to feel like lip service from a, an addict that doesn't really get it. Starting to change those patterns you know, to say, I am willing, like, it's uncomfortable for me. You know, I get very frightened. I don't know what to do. And, but I'm willing to work on it. And I'm going to try. That's the real apology. That's, that's how we change. Right. Okay. Now you can answer the, my essay husband doesn't want to provide a disclosure and his therapist isn't pushing. 
I want to know who's saying it. Actually, I'd like you to start that because it doesn't say anything about this. The person has training in this area. So correct. And yeah, this leaves me emotionally abandoned. Additionally, he says he can't heal while being married from your experience. What, what, while what would he say? Why would he say this? I guess that's why it's 511. No. Uh, Oh, where are we? Give me a It's time. a 505 yeah. anonymous attendee. My essay husband does not want to provide a disclosure. And so I'm right. curious if his, if his therapist is a CSAT trained therapist and actually gets this. Um, your, and if you're only hearing oh. from your essay husband that his therapist isn't, you know, isn't really setting a date, I would be, I would be wondering, and I would ask for a, a you know, a session with your hopefully CSAT trained therapist uh, for you with your husband. He says he can't heal while being married. That's totally like, that's such a, an excuse. Like he, like he's going to magically heal if he's divorced. I mean, that makes well, no sense. Go ahead. To me, I, I smell more. I'm so sorry. I, I do smell too. A girl, yeah. What comes up for me, I smell a girlfriend. I don't know why, oh. but you know, can't heal while being married. Doesn't want to give the information. So, um, you know, and by the way, you, Tammy says this all the time, you don't know whether, what that therapist said, maybe they are pushing him. And he says, no, I mean, just because as we come back from therapy and believe me, if we don't want you to hear something, we don't tell you. So um, I don't know what's really going on to his therapy, but um, this, first of all, I want to validate your feelings. Absolutely. I w- I think you should, you're dead on. I'm just very concerned about what's going on here that you don't know about. Um, now I can understand, I don't want to do disclosure because you're already upset and it's going to upset you more. I completely get that. And, um, and that's someone who doesn't really understand what it will do in the long term. but he's not saying that he's just sort of saying, I don't want to. And, you know, people, oh, can I say this people in hell want ice water? I mean, if he wants to stay in your relationship, he's going to have to step up, um, unless you are, this is okay with you. And I would ask you that I ask spouses every time, if this is okay with you, not getting disclosure and just sort of having this move on, you know, no one's going to blame you. You might end up back here, but no one is going to blame you. Um, yeah. Well, see, the, like, I, 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 w- I want to switch. What support are you getting for you? Because I hear mm-hmm. you feeling emotionally abandoned by your husband. He clearly can't be trusted. He's giving you all kinds of information, you know, like, well, what I'm reading if in this very short thing is um, he doesn't want to do this disclosure and he can't heal while he's married to you. So, so he wants to, it, it sounds like leave the relationship, not have to deal with the disclosure and be on his merry way. So I'm with Dr. Rob. I, you know, I think that there's a lot more going on. So what, support are you getting for you so regardless of what he's doing or not doing that you you know that you have the support you need to be able to be okay and not feel so emotionally abandoned but it's that's a tough one so but it's data like pay attention to the data so okay I'm a betrayer and will be starting doghouse workshop tomorrow. Great. I'm interested in beginning a 12 step program. I just purchased the green book and have joined a local 12 step call. My understanding is that going through the steps with a sponsor is really the only way to go through the process. I don't have a sponsor yet. What is the best way to get a good sponsor? This is a great question. Thank you for asking. Tammy? I was going to say, you want me. He, he, I love the 12 step. So, so you're just going to start all this. So the first thing, so you're going to probably be scared. We've got lots of resources, including lists of 12 steps. So, so there's in-person, but there's also online. Join our drop-in groups. Just say, this is my first meeting. I hear I need a sponsor. You know, is somebody willing to sponsor me? And pick somebody. And it doesn't have to be like a lifelong, you know, uh, this is not a lifelong relationship, although some people do. But it's, it's really one of those, you just need somebody who's ahead of you. I would ask them, you know, how long did it take you to go through the steps? You know, what was your process for going through the steps? But again, just get help. So, so starting, you'll, you'll also connect with people in the doghouse work group. Um, and you can ask mm-hmm. Jason, he's the one that leads that. You can ask him uh, for some support too. I would also highly encourage that you start working with, we talked about those CSAT trained therapists, getting the right help. Um, and if this is your first work group, 
all good, but you may want to consider the, uh, the sex addiction or porn addiction, depending on which is the right fit um, a work group as well, because that's a really solid foundation and they do make peer connections in those groups as well. So, um, so there's lots of resources. We've got a whole video series on under the resource tab under video on working through the steps um, uh, that may be oh, useful for you too. That's yeah. a great video. Yes. With Charlie Rizzi. And you're in that video. I am. As I but recall. Yes. Yeah. But it's really Charlie. Um, so so um, I agree that I agree with everything Tammy said. And um, I do think, though, that, for, for example, with me, well, a couple of things. Um, at least go to six or eight meetings before mm -hmm. you decide if you it's useful. Some people will go on being addicts. What we do is we look for the most troubled person in the room and we say, oh, my God, I don't do that. And then we say, I don't belong here and we leave. So try to keep your eye out more for people who tell stories like yours, because I would be thinking, wow, that might be someone I'd want to send a text to or something in the chat or whatever it is. You want to reach out to these people. They want you to reach out to them. So, you know, the only thing I would say different than Tammy is back in the old days, and I don't know if people still go to meetings, but I might say who would come out have a cup of coffee or who would, you know, to get to know some folks or it doesn't have to be a sponsor. Can someone just help me figure what all this is about? and help me understand sponsor you know and maybe they can be a guide toward that the only reason i say it a little different than tammy is i i think it's a hard thing to ask and i think you do really want to have scan, scoped out the room to see you know who might be the best person for you and you find that out by going and listening to what they have to say and thinking oh yeah they're a little further down the road that i am they seem to have you know done disclosure and they're over there you know you don't want someone who's brand new because they can't help you so anyway, but yes, you need one and you don't just need them to go through the steps. They can, they're they like a life advisor at some point. When you've poured out your heart over the course of 18 months to somebody you don't know about everything and they have supported you and held you, you know, you it's a relationship. And I have sponsors I'm still friends with many, many years later. Um, so uh, it and evolves over time. So, but it's a great question. A really and every question. meeting is a little different. I had the luxury of I was traveling and I went to a very cool meeting and I loved their format, but they, they, part of their process was to say, you know, and who is available to sponsor and people raised their hands. And so it wasn't even mm -hmm. like, you didn't even have to ask, you know, I was like, this is brilliant. And I've seen it, but it had been a while, but, but it's one of those, like you could, after the meeting, go up and talk to that person you know, and just say, you raised your hand, you know, as being a sponsor, I need a sponsor. Like you can do it almost covert. You don't have to go, I need a sponsor. So, so there, so be open, be willing. I'm so glad you're, you know, it's a, it's a lifelong journey. So you don't have to know it all before you go. So, okay. Next question is, thanks for everything you do. Will EMDR be an effective way to treat compulsive behavior? I grew up around promiscuous behavior, dad acting out, um, and now as a 33 year old man, my behavior aligns with behaviors that my dad does. Prostitutes and massage parlors always struggle with sobriety, but have found traction and paying attention to my body and what I'm feeling. Thoughts? Well, I, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I, I think that, you know, EMDR is really, it's most on solid ground with where the research is. And almost all the research talks about it being able to stabilize people have a lot of trauma. So, you know, growing up around promiscuous behavior, dad acting out, all of that stuff, I have a feeling it affected you, you know, things you saw, things you heard, ways you were parented, um, even if you weren't aware of them, but your mom was. So um, there is, if there's trauma and abuse, that is some of the energy, I guess, I don't like that word, but some of the psychic energy that's driving some of your acting out, of course, but it isn't the EMDR not for compulsive behavior. I know people who've taken courses, written books. It, there's just no proof that um, addiction itself is really, um, what's the word, um, eased by uh, EMDR. But it, it is about if the pressure underneath some of that is horrible memories or things that make you overwhelmed or, you know, that stuff, the intensity of the past can be alleviated. So the other thing I wanted to say is I really appreciate there are forms of, som of somatic therapy, which is a lot about, uh, oh, I noticed your breathing slowed when you stopped, or could you, you know, it's a lot about, or your hand 
seems to be, you know, tapping on the, I wonder what it means. And so there, there are therapies that are very, very useful that are more focused on the body uh, in relationship to what you're feeling and doing. And I think that is a great form of therapy as long as you're sober and you've gotten into recovery and now you're at the, at the sort of deeper level. So I guess there's a conflict here, which is if you're still engaging the behavior or still close to the behavior, then stabilizing you is the most important thing. And if that means reducing some trauma reactivity or going to lots of meetings or whatever you need to do, medication, whatever it is, great. Um, but the longer term issues, um, even the part about um, what your dad did in the relationship to you, that's something I'd really wait for until you feel solid in your recovery. So anyway, Tammy, you've seen lots of EMDR folks. What's your thought? I, I do, but it's always on a specific thing. It doesn't like cover no, everything. I just, no, I didn't no, no, mean no. that you, <laughs> I no. meant that you've worked with a lot. You've met a lot. Yeah, you know. no, it, yeah, I have. And I've done okay. my own personal EMDR. Like oh, it's, okay. it's great on a thing, you know, like on specific. one. Yeah, like, you know, so, and I love it. But, you know, it's not going to magically take away all the compulsive behaviors. But like Dr. Rob said, if there's something that's really, you know, triggering, but I, I, I think the body work, I think some mindfulness techniques, and we talk about that a lot as well. I did put in um, the attachment wound because I was like hearing a bunch of attachment wounds because your dad's behavior, I'm, I, 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 you know, abandonment, neglect, all of those things. So, so highly, um, highly can encourage you to check out um there's a work group for that and um with uh, it won't start again until september Try, reach out to me email me tammy t-a-m-i at seekingintegrity.com if you need more information on any of the resources we're talking about because i can be more specific when i can look for stuff so but glad you're asking the questions and glad you're working on the compulsive behaviors okay the next one is Two questions. I have had a problem with objectifying women. I am in recovery, but still notice women sometimes, which hurts my wife. I don't fantasize about them. How can I hurt my wife less? That's the first question. Um, I love sharing and being, this is the second one. I love sharing and yeah, being emotionally intimate. Well, I want to uh -huh, read both ahead. of them and go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love sharing and being emotionally intimate with my wife, but it makes me feel sexually aroused when we're not ready for sex yet. How can I prevent my sexual interest from being a problem? Okay, so I, I want to start with the second one, which is what is intimacy? Um, contrary to popular belief, intimacy has nothing to do with sex. Intimacy is about being known. I love the sharing part. I love the emotional intimacy part. But what does have to do? So is there anything physical going on? You know, um, that's what I, you know, when you say emotionally intimate, does that mean holding? Does that mean hugging? You know, so I would watch out for that if that's your goal to not be sexual. The other is, you know, it's a great opportunity to say, you know, sweetheart, I'm becoming aroused and I know that's not our goal. So I'm going to go read a book. I mean, because that kind of, I'm not going to take it forward, even though I'm feeling this way is what we do in addiction. You know, we, we put it down, even though we want to pick it up. So, and what a beautiful thing that this connection makes you aroused. That's beautiful. And keep your commitment. Don't make your partner keep your commitment for you. Mm -hmm. Some of us uh, say, oh, I'm going to not have sex for three months or a month. And then, you know, we're close to our partner and then we do. And then they think, wait a minute, didn't they say that they were, didn't they break this commitment right in front of me? So um, anyway, I, I think emotional intimacy doesn't sound like, with, I mean, I love emotional intimacy. I'm not sure it makes me feel aroused. Um, so uh, the first question, you want to hit that one, Tam? The, I had problems with objectifying women. I'm in recovery, but still notice women sometimes, which hurts my wife. So I don't fantasize about them. How can I hurt my wife less? It's I, what I hear is I have had problems. I mean, but I still notice women sometimes. So I don't know if you're using the three second rule, which doesn't mean you can gawk at them for three seconds. And, you know, it, it, it really is about, you know, turning away. And I'll tell you, you know, if you're with your wife, you know, how much more to focus on your wife, you know, like, like make sure you know, you're holding hands, you're looking intently in her eyes, you're having a conversation with her, not looking off and being distracted by other people. Yeah. So it's one of those where I think that you have the ability to do things differently, um, uh, you know, and your wife will notice that. And, and there's still going to be hurt if, 
you know, if you're objectifying and looking, but the more you're working to be in alignment, the more you're, you're, I mean, she'll feel the connection too. So, but it sounds like and you're I early in the add, process because you're not ready for sex yet. So it sounds like this is early. So having a plan. Right. And you know what? It, it, it's, she's going to have bad feelings about it. And it is true that you're a human being and we notice people who walk on and no matter how little, how short it is, how, you know, she's going to think whatever she thinks and she's going to feel bad. And, you know, I've had people say, and I don't know what your situation is or whether you consider objectifying doing this. I don't know what it means to you. So I'm not going to say that, but I've had people, you know, um, say things like, well, my goal is to not have any more sexual thoughts. I mean, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So the balance between what is reasonable, sorry, Tammy, go ahead. We're going to say, no, I was just like, like, that's impossible. So, you know, but people talk about it, you know, um, and the idea of all of this is not to eliminate your sexuality is to choose sex that is healthy for you. And I don't think there's anything unhealthy for someone to do that. I do think it's unhealthy for, to stare, to gawk, to follow. And this three second rule, as Tammy said, is I look for a second. I look away in the next second. And then I think of that person as someone's daughter or brother or son or whatever. I try to, or I pray for them. I try to humanize them. And then I don't look back. It isn't a waltz. I just keep moving. Um, and that's the end of that. So um, I'm human, not my job to stare. And I really wish them well. You know, I mean, that's what it is. But am I going to look? I think what's even worse is this, which is I'm not going to look my spouse. I'm not going to let my spouse see that I'm looking. Oh, I'm looking. I mean, that's even worse. So um, we should move on, Tam. We've got lots of yes. questions. Sorry. Yes, we do. So uh, can you suggest some good resources and or tools to use to build empathy out of the doghouse? The work group starts tomorrow. When my wife shows her pain, I never seem able to respond appropriately. Mm -hmm. I react and avoid. Then after the fact, I think of ways I should have responded, but it's too late. My wife then withdraws as she can't get the support she needs from me. And we go backwards. We are getting more and more distant. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I really don't mean to push my work. And when I sell a book, I make 10 cents because the yeah. publisher makes the rest. That's true. But um, you should get out of the doghouse because it is a book written for men who are struggling with helping their spouses, female in particular, well, how, how men can help a woman spouse feel um, like he gets what she's going through. The book is not necessarily about everything's going to be fine, but the, the path through is that you're not defending, you're not apologizing, you're not fixing, you don't have an agenda. You're just really looking at him, watching what's going on with your partner and responding in the way that makes the most sense for that situation. In other words, I want to say to somebody, look, it's been three months. Would you just give me a break? But the book says, I say, you know, um, it's been just three months and I completely understand you're feeling that way. And that doesn't come natively to me. I want to say, leave me alone, but that makes things worse. So um, I will say about this, about that. I don't think that we're bad people because we don't know how to support our, our partners through this. I think that we've never learned how to help ourselves work through pain, no less help somebody we care about work through pain. So, but you can learn and yeah, and that is available to you. Well, and, and I'm going to go, you know, because I hear you guys are in things are getting worse. So we have a treatment program and we work on those underlying issues, the stuff that's keeping you from being able to step into that space. You know, that's one of many things that our, our team is, you know, it, it, it like some people come to us, they have stopped the acting out behavior. They're, they're at that spot, but they are not making the progress that they need to for themselves or their relationship. And so that's the stuff that we can help with. So if that's, if, you know, if you're open to considering that, we have an amazing expert treatment team, including Dr. Rob, who works directly with the clients as well, you know, in our residential program. So that's my add on to that. So, okay, next question. My SAPA husband has been bouncing around since October saying he wants to fix things, but then he doesn't trickle. Oh, there's another come to treatment. Um, trickle days and retractions recently came to my vacation spot. He decided to stay in a different place, did not give me the location of his condo, saying he was worried I would want to stay there with him. My hope was, has always been recovery. He, has, uh, he was there five nights and expects me to believe nothing happened while he was alone most of those five nights. He doesn't understand why why that stressed me out or hurt me. 
what's the prescribed direction for couples dealing with no empathy, understanding of the betrayed partner? I give that Seeking to you. integrity treatment program. I'm like, I, at some point, what is it, you know, uh, how long? I say this often to, to couples because they're like, oh, I don't want to spend the money. I don't want to invest the time. And I'm like, what is it costing you to not get the help? I, I mean, I hear the pain. You have no reason to believe that nothing happened. I would not believe that. And he wanted to say separately because he didn't want to be together. I mean, it's like, oh my gosh, that's crazy making. So, so at some point, what healthy boundary do you need for you? What help do you need to see him get in order to be a different person? You know, I, we get such amazing, uh, I mean, I, it doesn't fix everything magically in the time that they're with us, but, but I hear so often, not just from the alumni, but from, from the partners and spouses that they see that he's making progress. They see that he's changing, you know, I, it, it, that's more meaningful to me than when the, when the alumni says it, you know, but it, it, it you have no reason to believe that he's willing to step into recovery at this point from he's showing you that so thoughts dr rob yeah i just I, I don't have a lot to say i think you said it and i think this is um it is very clear that this is a not someone who's respecting your relationship with yeah. you regardless of what they're doing um but um when you say what is the prescribed direction for couples i i really think what is the prescribed direction for you you know, you can't at this point do anything to influence your coupleship. But what does it mean to you that someone comes to visit you who's your lover, partner, friend, husband, and doesn't stay with you? I mean, I think that's how it's not about, I mean, you're getting a very clear message. How are you dealing with them? And a message. And I'm really glad you're here. But you are a perfect person to stop in the Betrayed Partners group, which is free. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's several of them, because I think that um, you would not only see this more clearly, I think you'd get a lot of support because you know what's going on here. I trust you completely. And even if that isn't going on, something ain't right. And, um, and you don't have to worry about why he, 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 that stressed you out. You don't have to worry about him not understanding. You just have to take care of you. And taking care of you is probably going to be pulling back a little bit. You know, whatever that is, he'll notice. <laughs> he'll notice. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think there's a lot you can do if someone goes, is that far out there that they don't even think about you when they're doing this. I, I'm not sure you can have much effect on him, but I think you can take much better care of yourself. I'm going to say one more option because Dr. Rob does a, a one-time expert consultation. And for some people that can be really helpful in clarifying what the issues are, engaging, you know, where somebody's willingness to move forward is so uh, so it, it's a one time two hours via zoom if that's something you're interested in you know email me and, or, and i'll tell you more about it so okay next question the trade mail uh would a therapeutic disclosure provide me with a clear and cohesive story that is necessary to represent my past since all my presuppositions of what i thought i was real has been flipped upside down. I'm, I, I know that this doesn't help you any, but I want to point out to everyone that men get betrayed too. Mm -hmm. And women are sex addicts and women are porn addicts. We having, I think, created and run the first treatment center for female sex addicts. I can tell you that um, they need places to go. They need support. No one understands them. You know, what do you think of a woman who's having a lot of sex, what do you call that woman versus a man? It's very difficult for them to get help. So I really appreciate that you're here and that your spouse um, is working on, uh, it looks, I think herself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Could be his, himself. Well, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's Could a male himself. partner, let's, right. yeah. So That's so fine. Him or her. So, but, yes. yeah. but anyway, if you're with a woman, I'm glad to hear you're here. Um, if you're gay, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. um, I see the capital C's and I'm not sure, you know, I think you really wanted us to hear the word clear and cohesive because that's what you want. I hear you. Um, I don't think that a therapeutic disclosure is about getting a clear and cohesive story of everything that's happened. Um, it's just the beginning. It's just information. It isn't even on the way to an apology or please forgive me. It's simply an inventory 
you know, uh, and the way I like to do a disclosure is on a single page, you know, you're writing 15 or 20 things that the spouse absolutely didn't know about. And you're just saying, here's my list. Here's my list. And then spouses get to ask questions that they've been meaning to ask for a while or whatever. And then you may come back and ask questions later or whatever. But it isn't um, going to give you a, a full presentation of what's going on in your relationship over years and years. It will tell you when you're on vacation in Hawaii that he or she snuck off and you were right. They didn't just go shopping and maybe that they saw a sex worker, but it's not going to tell you the meaning or how it relates to the relationship or what the two of you um, have been experienced together outside of just the acting out. It is simply a list of what I did sexually and romantically that you don't know about. Um, and sometimes the money that I spent in that process as well, stuff like that. Um, but maybe Tammy, I, I don't understand the question because it is broad. What do you think? I, like, here's what I, male or female partner, it doesn't matter. Of course, okay. your world has been flipped upside down and you're trying to take all of these pieces that are jumbled up and make sense of all of it. And the, and I say this to partners all the time, you cannot understand with your normal brain how an addict can do this stuff. And, and ad, that's why we need support you know, by other people like us, because addicts a hundred percent understand not as, not that it's justified, you know, the compartmentalization, the lies, the deceit, the lying to ourselves. And so, so a formal therapeutic disclosure, and it kind of answers the next question too. a formal therapeutic disclosure can set a, a, a foundation for healing, you know, for the couple, it is not going to make sense of everything that has been flipped upside down. That's, that's a process for you you know, to get support and healing for you um, to put the pieces together. Because while you think nothing was ever truthful, there were pieces that were like, it, it, like that's the compartmentalization of like, you know, when we were together and all that, was that a lie? No, that was actually real, you know, but, but yeah, there was chaos and everything else around it. So, so, so it's just challenging um, to be, it's, no, it's horrible to be in that position of having your whole world turned upside down. Hopefully the, your partner is working diligently on being a better person, being a different person and being able to show up for you and the relationship. So I'm going to quickly add to the next question because it's five months in my recovery. Why is full disclosure mm -hmm. important? And when does it occur? Talk to your CSAT. This is not a do-it-yourself thing. This is so. And this so, is not a twelve-step thing either. No, it's a no, formal, this, yes, therapeutic so, disclosure. Right. So, so that's the question. And every CSAT does it a little bit differently, but it really is working on getting you prepared and your partner having the support to get prepared as well. And then, you know, that then that is an event event but it's part of the you know it's still part of the journey i keep using journey but i like them as a band too but anyway so next Yuck. question yeah no i'm enough older than you um i heard you mention emdr That's is true. it usual to do this one time one event or multiple times for one event it depends on how it how you do i mean um they're targeting a specific issue um you might have all kinds of memories that come around that and then you might have to work on it more it's sort of like i don't know I'm trying to think of a it's like sanding something down you know you might have a piece of wood that's fairly smooth you don't have a lot of sanding to do you might have one that's you know splinter ready and it needs more work but generally i think they go in like um like a series if i'm not wrong like people go for four times or they go six times also that um so it, i would not uh, go to EMDR on my own. I would be seeing a therapist who said to me, I think EMDR would be helpful for this. This isn't like going on, uh, how do I say this? It isn't something that you just say, oh, I, this is what I decided to do and I'm going to go see an EMDR specialist. It is something that a therapist who isn't an EMDR specialist may say, let's do a little bit of this, but it's a technique. It's not the whole thing. You know, it is a part of therapy that's useful in certain circumstances, but if that's all that person does, then you're just going for a consultation. You're not going to see them as a primary therapist. Um, I love, I got to, can we answer this question? 
I don't know if we have that, any more we're time, gonna, we, no, we do. I want to answer both of these. Dr. Rob, you said once the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. And you've talked about this a lot. But how do you become indifferent? I still have so many mixed emotions against abusive spouse who abandoned me. Well, I think the indifference comes with time. And, you know, I think indifference comes with making your own peace. It has nothing to do with what they do. If you are not able to come to terms, you know, you might back off, you might distance. Um, of course, you have all these mixed emotions. I mean, and someone who's abusive and they abandon you, I bet they pulled on every trigger you have. But I will say this, um, when you love someone, you'll always love them. And I have spouses say, you know, or people say, well, he or she was so abusive and I shouldn't have feelings for them after what they did. Of course you will. I mean, it's not like you can erase the feelings you have someone altogether. It, it, you know, hurt is not an eraser. So time might be, but hurt is not. So um, I think that when you come to peace with what this is for you, you're either going to want to move forward or move back. And I don't think you get to either. You can't pick that place. <laughs> you know, you may want to be indifferent because you're still in all this pain, but you're not because you still feel all this connection. And, you know, um, I don't stop loving someone when they die. I don't stop loving someone when they hurt me. Um, but yes, deep hurt and anger is very different than indifference. Indifference is really indifference means I'm ready to move on. That's what indifference means. Not that I'm in, not that I'm with them and I just feel nothing, but indifference means I'm done. That's what it means to me. Sorry. Yeah, and, and I've seen that play out, you know, for people where, you know, they, they used mm. to be in the emotional, you know, stew and all, you know, like you see them finding their own path and their own life and what the addict is doing or not doing is of less consequence. You know, it's just kind of like, well, whatever, I'm doing my own thing. And so when the relationship has ended, then it's more about grieving um, grieving the loss of the relationship, grieving the loss of what you hope for. So to me, it feels like you, you're in a place where grieving uh, is the work that is in front of you, which is a process. So, okay. Last question. Does delusional thinking continue within essays recovery? Working in therapy, 12-step couple therapy now, uh, go, great, but going, or not great, but going, warmed a seat for two years, but now starting to do the work. So so what's the question? By Does the way, my, my dog thinking. is no longer licking me. He's biting me, which means oh. freaking feed me. He's yeah. hungry. I don't want I to understand. eat me. So what, what is Does the delusional thinking continue with an essay's recovery? And I'm going to say yes with, and it's not just essay, it's any addiction. Like, yeah, yes, that's, I mean, that's why people relapse. They, they, they magically think, oh, I'm doing better now. So I can quit doing all the things that were working or I've got this now. I mean, I hear that a lot of like, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm doing so much better because the life circumstances got a little bit better. So therefore I'm going to quit doing all of the things that have actually worked for me. And then they're mad. They're so confused that how did this happen? I've relapsed. So, so my spouse has forgiven me so I can yes. slowly back away from this. Yes. Work. Yes. Um, I, I think that this is a lifelong process and my thinking is skewed. If I had time, I'd tell you stories, but the bottom yeah, line is yeah. I try, I try to write, I try to run many of my decisions, anything meaningful past someone else. Me I don't too. just, there's a part of me that says, I want what I want and I don't care what anybody else thinks. There's just that part of me and it can apply to addiction or it could be something expensive that I want to buy. And I don't want to tell my spouse how much it's going to cost, but it is in me that sense of entitlement and I need to constantly work on it, especially since I may never fully see it. And so I have to run my stuff by other people. Um, that's why you go to those programs and why you go to these groups. And, anything and you have me? people that know you so that they can go, well, I hear what you're saying, but you know, did you right. think of that? And they can say it in a loving way and call you on your BS. So that's, I, I'm a hundred percent and it's delusional. It doesn't matter what form of addiction, like we get very compartmentalized and blinders down because we you know we've got a plan so and, our, and just remember our best thinking got us here so so it's one of those where we need other people to have input on our lives so thank you all this was fantastic mm -hmm. questions thanks for being here thank you dr rob call me hey guys in treatment right. i will see you tomorrow all right talk to you later bye bye